Hello and welcome to our RKL webinar series, Coronavirus and its Impact on People, Process, and Profits. Before we start today's call, we would like to share a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. We will provide you a link to the recording when it is available via email. All materials were emailed to all registrants around 10.30 a.m. this morning. You can also find the materials on our Coronavirus Resource Center at rklcpa.com. All lines are muted and will remain muted during the webinar. Questions can be submitted using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. However, due to the size of the group today with more than 900 registrants, we will only have time to address a few questions throughout the webinar. RKL clients who have questions specific to their organizations should reach out directly to your RKL advisor. One hour of CPE in the field of business law will be issued to participants on this call. To receive your CPE, participants must be connected to the session, both audio and presentation, for its entirety. Additionally, participants must answer three questions and elements of engagement. Elements of engagement will be through the polling feature. If you're viewing through a web browser, ensure that you have pop-ups enabled. Additionally, if you're using multiple monitors, the poll may appear on your second screen. At this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Ryan Hurst, who will introduce our team for today's webinar. Ryan, the floor is yours. Morning, everybody, and welcome back uh, for our new Friday morning tradition every Friday at 11 a.m. Uh, this week we have the same panel as as next week or as last week. Um, myself, I'll be giving you some updates on the uh, process to reopen Pennsylvania, uh, as well as some um, PPP and other kind of market uh, stimulus updates. Uh, Bethany will be again uh, diving into PPP loan forgiveness uh, items this week in much more of an FAQ, a frequently asked question style. And then finally, Stephanie will be wrapping things up with workforce reinstatement considerations and frequently asked questions there. So the uh, first thing I'd like to kick off is the process to reopen Pennsylvania. Um, this has gotten some um, publicity of late and, and it's the one kind of hopeful thing we're all hanging on to uh, as we all look to seek some level of normalcy in our lives. Uh, the Governor Wolf had announced a data-driven phased approach to reopening Pennsylvania. Uh, this is an part of the data and not in its entirety, uh, but kind of the key critical data is a target goal of fewer than 50 new confirmed cases per 100,000 population in, a in the previous 14 days. Uh, and we'll look at what that looks like by county uh, in, in a couple slides, uh, but that's kind of the, the key target metric, although it's important to understand that that's not the only thing that's gonna be, be looked at. Um, there's gonna be other tests or other um, elements looking at whether there's sufficient testing available in a, in a geographic area or county uh, whether there's a robust case investigation and contract contact tracing uh, capabilities, uh, whether there are sufficient safeguards in place at high-risk institutions. Uh, those types of things are going to be considered as well as uh, industry considerations. So what are there uh, in particular industries? What types of risk profiles of, of different companies? Uh, what kind of teleworking abilities do, do different companies have? Uh, so it's definitely not necessarily going to be this perfectly clean reopening that we all would, would hope for. Uh, and there may be some times that, that things look counterintuitive, uh, or perhaps uh, somebody might even be saying, well, my county is below the uh, 50 new confirmed cases metric, so why aren't we open yet? Uh, there are going to be some other considerations there. 
On the right side of, of your screen is uh, a regional map of Pennsylvania that was set out probably about a week ago. Um, this was the original thought was that there would be a regional reopening. So clusters of six, seven, eight counties, something like that is presented on the screen. And it would be basically when the entire region is open, that is when a particular county opens up. That does not appear to be the case any longer. Uh, I think that's maybe in play to some extent, but it's not going to be hard and fast as, the, as was originally thought uh, on, this, on this side of things. So, um, you know, be aware that it might not necessarily be that, you know, for instance, Lancaster or Berks counties may or may not end up actually being lumped in with other Philadelphia counties. Uh, another consideration with this reopening is going to be the uh, availability of personal protective equipment or PPE, as you'll hear it referenced today. Uh, PPE, not to be confused with PPP. Uh, the acronyms are going to get really confusing by the, by the end of, of this whole thing. Uh, but that availability in hospital stockpiles in a particular uh, either county or region uh, is going to be an important standard that needs to be met in order to uh, have permitted reopening. Uh, in one positive sign for uh, the many outdoor enthusiasts, um, golfers especially, is today uh, limited outdoor activities uh, have resumed in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, so hopefully somebody on this call is actually listening to us from the from the eighth fairway, and uh, hopefully somebody's uh, having having some some enjoyment with things. Sorry, I got ahead of myself there. So the phased approach, uh, this is what's going to be taking, it, taking place in Pennsylvania. This is sort of the, the how things will ultimately be reopened. Uh, and it's important to note that everybody, the entire uh, state of Pennsylvania, all counties are currently in this red column, the red phase. And that's the, that's the shelter in place, the stay at home orders, the life sustaining businesses, all those types of phrases are in this red column on the left side of, of this chart. No need to really cover that because everybody knows the kind of the current situation there. Uh, later today, uh, at some point today, Governor Wolf is gonna be hosting a pref press conference and is gonna be giving a little bit more detail on uh, this whole reopening as well as counties that are permitted to reopen next, uh, next Friday, May 8th, and those counties would be essentially moving into the, into the yellow phase. And what the yellow means, it's not really a, a full opening, it's sort of a soft opening or, or instead of a light switch going from off to on, it's really more of a dimmer switch uh, being slowly ratcheted up. Uh, some of the things to, to point out in the yellow area is you'll still have uh, lots of telework, uh, telework for, especially for companies where that's, where that's feasible. Uh, safety orders are going to remain in place, so the various building restrictions and, and physical worksite uh, restrictions that, are, that you're hearing about, masks and those sorts of things, uh, will continue to, to remain in place. Uh, there's still going to be prohibit, prohibition on large gatherings of more than 25 people. Um, retail and restaurants are permitted to, to open, but there's going to be a strong preference for carryout, curbside delivery, um, those types of, of, of models. And importantly, indoor recreation, so gyms, spas, theaters, those types of, of consumer-oriented businesses will ultimately uh, remain, remain closed, uh, even when a county enters the, the yellow phase. So here's the, the by-county um, situation that I mentioned a, a moment ago. Um, this, there's a map that's available um, online uh, through the Department of Health that they basically go through by every county in Pennsylvania and the data that we have is as of, as of yesterday, looking at what that metric is with respect to the 50 new cases per 100,000 people over 14 days. So what we did is we actually, for kind of the southeastern quarter or so of the state, uh, we actually overlaid what the uh, case counts were as of yesterday. So you can see how your particular county compares to uh, that 50 person case, uh, person case count. Um, so you can see here there's still a lot of red, which means that if the, if 
these figures were the sole um, determinant as to whether a county moves from the red phase to the yellow phase. There are only three counties, at least in those that we've demonstrated here, that actually would move into uh, the yellow into the yellow phase. Most counties are uh, are continuing to be in the red phase and probably will be continue to be in the red phase for for the next uh, a couple or few weeks. Uh, a couple particular notes: Berks County, where where I'm sitting in. Uh, congratulations for everybody that's in there, like me. We have the highest level of counts in the state, so it's not looking so good for us folks in in Berks County. Uh, Lancaster County a lot better off. York looking really good actually currently in the yellow and uh, some of the Philadelphia area counties uh, not not so great as well. Uh, you'll see kind of the overlaid chart however um, with these these trend lines. One good thing for Berks County is that Berks County has been trending down. So you can see that uh, as of a, a week ago, a little over a week ago, um, the case count, uh, that metric was actually a, over 350, so that at least we're heading in the right direction. Uh, you can see some of the other trend lines that were reported in the, uh, in the Lehigh, in, uh, Lehigh Valley uh, publication yesterday, uh, which is the source of, of this chart. So let's switch gears now that we've talked a little bit about the, uh, the, about the Pennsylvania reopening and start getting into the PPP program. Uh, so PPP was refilled last week. We touched on that. Uh, then it officially reopened on Monday, April 27th. Uh, anybody who followed the news on, on this reopening noticed that it was very rocky. There were a lot of challenges. Uh, many of those challenges surrounded the, the ETRAN program, which is basically how banks are interacting with the SBA on that. Um, so it was definitely choppy. Things seem to have smoothed out as the week is going on. Um, but the one success that, that we're seeing as far as data that, that, that we've seen is through April 29th, which is Wednesday. So we're, you know, we're dated by a day and a half at this point. Uh, the first three days saw 960,000 loans processed for about $90 billion worth of, of loans, uh, loan amount which means an average loan size of less than $100,000. Uh, so certainly a big dip compared to the $206,000 average loan size in the first round of PPP. So uh, many are claiming that this has been a, a big success with getting funds to the smallest of the small business owners and really driving that average loan size down. And uh, 5,300 lenders, or more than 5,300, have participated in round two of the PPP so far. Again, a, a markable increase compared to uh, about 4,500 or so lenders uh, that were in the entire first round. So we're seeing more lenders, smaller loans, those types of things. Uh, one last note on the, the refill, I mean, things are going quickly. They're, they were expected to go quick. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio had released uh, some, I think, speculation yesterday that there's probably going to be a need for a round three. Uh, so hopefully no one on the phone is, is dragging their feet on this, but if you are and are looking for proceeds from, from these funds, uh, it's important to get that taken care of immediately. So on the guidance front, uh, we have a few updates for you as well. Um, some of these I'm gonna go through very quickly because they're more case specific and not necessarily um, you know, gonna be relevant to, to all 900 folks that are, that are on the webinar today. Uh, there was an update posted that applies to seasonal businesses uh, as it relates to uh, loan applications. So not necessarily the forgiveness side, but the loan application side. So if you're a seasonal business and have uh, specific questions, you can certainly look that up or, or ask us more about that. Uh, there is an interim final ruling on disbursements, which is mostly for lenders. Um, but the one thing it did say is that there's really a single disbursement. It's not, a, it's not something that can be timed uh, to the benefit of, of the borrower. An interfinal, interim final ruling on corporate groups and non-bank lenders. Uh, not a lot there. Corporate groups are probably not applicable to anybody on this call, but it's really kind of large institutions with multiple entities, um, you know, the kind of the, the big of the big uh, in that, that element, well beyond the affiliation rules that we've touched on before. Uh, then there were a series of frequently asked questions. 
not in necessarily in order. Uh, number 32, uh, this one we have on the right side of the page. Uh, the reason I bring this up is not because housing stipend, stipends and allowances are going to uh, be right in the front and center for many folks, but I, I thought it was interesting in the response that they didn't just simply answer, yes, these housing stipends and stipends and allowances are permitted, but they made a statement that, in, that this payroll cost includes all cash compensation to employees subject to the $100,000 limit. It's interesting that they answered it in that way. So it's, you know, can you read into it and say, are they addressing other forms of cash compensation, not just strictly housing stipends or allowances? We do not know the answer to that, but it's, inter it's an interesting takeaway from this, this FAQ 32. Uh, 34 and 35 related to agricultural producers, farmers, ranchers, and cooperatives. Uh, 36 was headcount versus FTEs. Just an important distinction that we've been making all along. Total headcount uh, without respect to hours worked. Um, that's for the application phase. FTEs is the forgiveness phase of things. Uh, FAQ 38, um, this is, is gonna be a very, uh, this is for very specific situations where somebody uh, acquired the ownership of the business after February 15th, but that business had been long operating. Uh, we've had some cases of clients asking about that and uh, wondering, you know, what do they do? I bought, I bought a business on February 20th. The business has been operation for a long time, but it's new to me. What does that look like? Well, the answer is, is that you can look back to the prior ownership, use prior ownership payroll records and that sort of thing. And finally on this slide, and, and really most importantly, um, and probably most applicable to everybody, uh, the IRS last night came out with a, a statement, um, some guidance. It was seven pages long to get to what could have been a seven word answer. Basically that forgiven expenses are not going to be tax deductible. Uh, there's a lot else in there. It seems more like justification than anything else, but the important takeaway is that forgiven expenses, if you get forgiven on for, let's say, a payroll expense or, or your rent, the amount that is forgiven is not going to be tax deductible uh, for the IRS. So let's get into more of the meat of some of the updates. Um, this particular one isn't necessarily an update. It's really just to kind of rehash something from uh, last week that we covered on FAQ 31. Uh, this is the one that was specifically addressing public companies that have taken money, but it kind of opened the, the door to other businesses have other sources of liquidity, um, other needs, is there a financial need, whatever the case may be. Um, there's been additional guidance then re uh, related to that this week, and that's really what I want to spend my time covering. So FAQs 37 and to some extent 39 get into this a little bit more. Uh, FAQ 37 actually with basically private equity firms, they don't say private equity, but they say businesses owned by private companies with adequate sources of liquidity, definitely private equity, maybe some others could be, be fit in that. Um, they're directing them back to FAQ 31, but FAQ 31, remember, was all about the need, financial need, access to liquidity, and those sorts of things. So they're definitely continuing to expand uh, the, this, and as stated last week, we're just not sure how far they're going to go um, with that, but so far nothing new as it relates to anybody other than public, public companies and, and private equity firms. And then there's also FAQ 39 on this slide, uh, which has to do with the announcement earlier this week uh, that the SBA is going to be uh, reviewing or auditing um, in their terms uh, loans loans, so the loan amounts that were in excess of $2 million, uh, as well as some other loans as appropriate. So if you got a loan that is, is more than $2 million, you're going to have an audit at the forgiveness stage of the loan. That's actually one of the clearest things that they've actually stated thus far. If you have a loan that is $2 million or under, there is always that chance that you will be audited, but it doesn't seem like that's the target area. Again, I think this really goes down to kind of cracking down on some of the companies and really assessing whether there was true financial 
need or not at the uh, at the time that the loan was applied for. So there's been some definitely some concern around this. So so one of the things that we thought we'd do for you is start to look at okay, well if we have to substantiate economic need, what does that actually look like? Um, and I think you really need to address two questions basically in writing, and that's to say, well, why did you apply for the loan and why should the loan be forgiven? And there's going to be very specific, on the forgiveness side, there's going to be very specific documentation that you'll need to support or provide to your lender for support. And Bethany's going to cover that in a little bit. But for this, this is more for kind of your, your own work files, not necessarily to be provided, but if ever asked about, you know, why did you do this? You're going to want to have robust documentation. You're going to want to have your thoughts on paper so you can recollect exactly what was going for your mind and you can justify, you know, why you applied, why there was economic uncertainty with respect to your business, why you needed these funds. So a few of the, the thoughts that we have at, at this point is, you know, there's the office, four shutdowns. My business was shut down, but maybe it's your business wasn't shut down. Maybe it was your customers, maybe it was your vendors. You know, is there a situation there that, that you're open, but nobody's coming in the door? Um, what kind of board level or management, executive management level discussions uh, have you had? Can you document those in, in formal meeting minutes? Uh, cash flow modeling, are you doing modeling and, and do you have, kind of without a loan or without forgiveness scenarios that consider things like, well, if we had, if we didn't get this money, we would have had to have laid off X number of our employees, but because we got the money, we got to keep them all, or we got to keep substantially all of them. I mean, that would be a great, great case to show somebody who's looking to audit this and say, look, this is the thought process that was at that, at that time. We had a lot of economics uncertainty and we saw this as a, as a, as a much, uh, much needed need, so to speak. Um, revenue back, backlog, declines, delays. Um, are you having trouble collecting cash? Or are you having declines in your productivity? You know, all types of things that could be documented, whether it's through the actual cash flow modeling or at least addressing some of those concerns on paper. So you can go back and say, on this day, this is what we were thinking. Um, are you having just conversations with your customers, vendors, employees, your bankers? Are they causing you, you heartache and, and is, it, is it posing a challenge for your business? Uh, what about you know, costs that you're incurring for COVID? Uh, so maybe these aren't necessarily forgivable expenses, but to the extent that you're installing uh, physical plexiglass type barriers, or you know, for us, we've, we've moved a lot of our, our equipment. We have folks that, that have copy machines in their houses, for instance, and there's a cost to transporting that, setting it up, and those types of things not probably going to be forgivable expenses, but certainly those types of things are the things that demonstrate that yes, your business was impacted and we, we incurred financial hardship that we need to be covered. Uh, what about rehires? So, you know, to the extent that you laid somebody off early on and then you said, wow, we got this loan and now we could bring them back. That's certainly a check in the good column for, for having a financial need. Uh, what about season work, seasonal working capital stress? So we had uh, some emails with a client uh, yesterday who was saying, well, I have, I have lots of room on my line of credit right now, but this is, my, this is a point in the time that I usually have a lot of, of room on my line of credit. What about next fall? If I tap that out now and it's something because of financial hardship that we're not going to be, be able to repay, by that point in time, I'm not going to have any more capacity on my line. Then what? Then what do I do? You know, that type of thought process should be good to demonstrate the uh, financial need that, that 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 business has, for instance. And finally, looking at your loan covenants on your existing debt and saying, okay, well, maybe we've been passing all along, but what do they look like now? And with and without this loan, are we going to be able to um, be able to, you know, continue to to fund our business? Are we going to have adequate uh, you know, cash on, on board, are we going to be able to meet some of the loan covenants? And will this, you know, will this loan, assuming forgiveness, actually support that? And finally, uh, the other, some other news on the PPP, just a couple, a couple quick points here. Um, we had uh, seen some, some interesting news yesterday in the marketplace that uh, the Treasury Deputy Secretary, Justin Musinich, uh, was dispatched to the SBA. 
Um, I thought that was was kind of telling because we've been hearing a lot of of, of some of the the challenges that the SBA is, has uh, has been uh, experiencing with this, and it's interesting that the that the Treasury is providing additional leadership in this case. So, what we're hoping for is this will relate will, will ultimately lead to uh, more significant guidance coming out in the, in the coming days. Uh, all of us, I think, by now had anticipated that we would have a lot more definitive loan forgiveness guidance. We don't have that yet. Uh, perhaps this is a sign that that will be forthcoming when uh, when additional leadership is is in place there. Uh, and the final point I just wanted to make uh, as far as, you know, kind of other news, uh, there's been some um, news this week as far as the desire to have uh, loan recipients for CARES Act programs have the uh, names of their companies and other information publicly disclosed. Uh, that is the, going to be the case with some of the other loan packages, such as the Main Street Lending Program. Uh, that is not currently the case as it relates to PPP, although there is some uh, desire out there amongst a, a number of, of people and groups to actually require those uh, names of PPP recipients to be disclosed. So just wanted to at least have that on your radar. So with that in mind, we'll bring up our first polling question of the day, and then in a moment, I'll turn it over to, to Bethany. Uh, so this polling question is, if your business is currently restricted from operating, do you plan to reopen as soon as permitted? And yes, no, or we have been operating at or near capacity. Uh, as a reminder, uh, you need to, for continuing education credits, uh, to be eligible for those credits, you need to answer all three of our, uh, our, our polling questions today. Uh, so make sure even if you don't know or don't have the correct answer, just choose one of them and, and submit it. That way you can get your continuing education credit. Uh, we'll leave that up for uh, two or three more minutes and I will turn it over to Bethany. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, we're going to move along here just in the interest of time. Um, try to keep these questions going, but make sure you answer the polling question to get your credit. So in the last week, I'm glad to be back. Um, we went over some PPP loan forgiveness basics last week, and out of that came a flurry of questions. So we've tried to aggregate the questions. We have some themes here. I'm also watching the questions coming in today, and hopefully we'll hit a lot of them. As Ryan said, there's still a lot of gray area, but we're filtering through and we're going to give you our best um, recommendations on where guidance is still awaited and what you can do in the meantime. So let's get on to our questions this morning. So for the first one, if you have an incorrect PPP loan amount, this is an interesting one and I received this from several of our clients. So on the PPP loan application, we all remember that was a bit of a flurry of activity um, done pretty quickly. We did our best uh, to calculate payroll expenses, but I'm finding that some of them were calculated, I don't want to say wrong, but um, probably that's the best word to use, um, and payroll expense times the 2.5 resulted in a loan amount that many of our clients are realizing it's a little bit off or maybe a lot off um, of what they should have received. So they're asking us what they should do about that. They're concerned that maybe they received too much. So our answer to that one at this point is if you're in that situation, um, this is uh, particularly we would encourage you to track your PPP funds um, very closely and segregate the funds if possible because those excess funds, we're going to call them, in excess of what you should have received, um, you might want to talk to your banker about that. Right now they're very busy, but as we get towards the end of this eight-week period, um, You'll know what those excess funds are, have them in a separate account in case you either need to return them or in case you choose to prepay your um, loan or return them yourself. So there, better be safe than sorry is the theme of the day um, and track those funds. Okay, transportation costs. Actually, I think I'm going to go back here. Okay, no, transportation costs. Okay, I see that transportation costs are an approved use of PPP funds. How are transportation costs defined? 
Well, as of today, we have not seen any specific guidance on this item. So sometimes I know it brings you guys comfort to know if there's an item you're looking for, and we haven't found either, and we have a lot of people watching a lot of sources. Um, know that it's just not that you're not finding it. Um, at the, as of this point, it doesn't seem to be out there. So hopefully transportation expenses or transportation costs are not a make or break item for your forgiveness or for your loan amount indeed. So we would say to calculate your forgiveness before including any amounts. And again, hopefully at that point, you certainly wanna do your 75% payroll cost expense. And then when you add your other items such as your mortgage interest, your rent utilities, other than transportation, hopefully you have enough as we get more guidance, um, we'll bring that to you, and then hopefully we'll know a little bit better of a definition of what you can include. Clickers, just going back and forth. Okay, so I saw that there's a lot of people on here from nonprofits, so I did want to address this question that's coming in. So I'm a nonprofit. The salary for one of my employees is paid by a grant. Can I include this employee's salary in payroll costs for PPP purposes? So our answer is yes. As we read the guidance, you are able to include the employee's, nope. thank you. You are able to include the employee's salary as long as you're paying them directly through your normal payroll process. So what I'm saying there is if this employee receives a check from your organization and is included in your normal payroll process, meaning that they are included on your payroll tax returns, specifically here, we're gonna talk a little bit later about your 941 quarterly filing. Um, that's the one that withholds the withholding tax and the Social Security and Medicare computation. You'd want to make sure that they're receiving a check and they're included on these payroll tax filings. If so, they are an employee of your organization and you can include them in payroll costs. A note that the monies that you receive from the grant, we're receiving questions on that. That's simply a revenue source for your organization. It does not negate your payment of their salary. How, do, how does the Families First Corona Response Act credits impact my PPP loan? Well, the qualified sick and family leave wages that qualify for a credit under the Family First Corona Response Act should be excluded from payroll costs for purposes of PPP forgiveness. We added this one back in because as employees are returning to the workforce, um, it's coming up again. You know, we have employees that need to take um, qualified sick, family leave. So this is something that we're probably going to see as we start getting up and functional. So I wanted to spend a little time on restoration of forgiveness this morning and particularly talk about the headcount restoration. So the question here is that I understand I must restore all of my employees headcount by the end of the covered period to avoid a reduction in my forgiveness. I also understand if I do not restore headcount by the end of my covered period, I have until June 30 to restore my FTEs. But what if my covered period ends after June 30th? Do I get extra time to restore my headcount? So what's happening this week is all our PPP recipients that are expecting to receive funds mid end of next week and after, their covered period is actually going to end after June 30th. So the question is coming up, hey, if I already see my funds, I would have a little extra time until June 30th, but it looks like my covered period is going to run after June 30th. What does that mean to me? So right now, the eight-week period um, covers periods ending June 30th or after. If you're after, as it's written, you must restore your FT headcount by June 30th to avoid penalty. So that's when you want to watch if you are receiving your PPP funds, if you haven't gotten them yet, but you're expecting to get them here later in May, you want to keep an eye on that June 30th date. If guidance has changed, we'll of course bring that to you, but you want to have your eye on that. A side question, because I am watching questions coming in, um, we do have a lot of calls from people saying, hey, can I restore them on the 28th and the 29th? Just a caution there on two things. Number one is, remember you have to meet the 75% payroll expense test. 
So if you bring them back, you know, a day or two before the end, you're probably not going to have enough payroll. And that's what we've seen happening among our borrowers um, and clients. But the second thing also is that if you notify your workforce that they're coming back in late June, they may say that sounds fine, but you really don't want to count on them showing up the day or two before June 30th. Things change, situations come up, and you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're short on a headcount a day or two before this June 30th date. You can hire other employees to make your headcount to bring your headcount up. That's also a question I've been seeing, um, but you don't want to have to do that within a day. You're not leaving yourself a lot of time. So our counsel at this point is to bring them back a little bit earlier. Again, theme of the day, better to be safe than sorry. So we're getting tons of questions on self-employed individuals, and I actually have two slides here. This first one is I'm going to target at self-employed individuals. These would be individuals that file the Schedule C of your 1040. My next slide, just to warn you, I'm going to talk about the S-Corps and what to do if you have employees that also own stock in the S-Corp. So the first question on self-employed is, what is eligible for PPP loan forgiveness for the self-employed individuals? Again, individuals that, ha that file the Schedule C. So again, we're looking at the eight-week covered period, and there's a couple items you would include. The first is payroll cost as defined by the interim rule. And those can be for employees, if you have employees, the qualified payroll costs that you would pay for them. In addition, you can have owner compensation replacement, and this is limited to 850 seconds of your 2019 net profit, and again excludes any qualified sick or family leave equivalent amount for which a credit was claimed. Then we have the interest payments on the mortgage, the rent on lease agreements, and the utility payments. So the punchline there is you both have payroll costs for employees, does not include the benefits for owners, just the employees, and then an owner compensation replacement, which would be limited to that uh, 15385 we talked about last week, and that's 850 seconds of your 2019 net profit. So this is not to be confused with individuals that may own stock in an S corporation, they're a shareholder, but they're also employed by, that, by the S corporation. So this is a lot of our clients, so I wanted to speak to that today. For companies that are applying for the PPP loans, the shareholders who are active in the business and receiving a paycheck were considered employees. And hopefully, if you already applied, that's, you applied that way. But for loan forgiveness, you would also then include their payroll, again, up to the cap of 15385 for the eight-week cover period, and you can include their, the company paid portion of the group health insurance for these individuals. You can also include 401k match on all your employees, including these individuals, and the employer portion of state unemployment taxes. Just a side note, I see a question coming in about the 401k match. This is just the portion that the company pays and not the employer um, amount, but the amount that they, Employ, not the employee amount, I'm sorry, but the amount that the employer would pay that would be an expense on the company um, tax return. Another question on the profit sharing. So what if we contribute to profit sharing for our employees for 2019 and our payment is typically due later this year? So I've had a lot that maybe their payment's due towards the end of the summer or even September. They want to know if they can pay and deduct this during the cover period and include it as a payroll cost. So more guidance is needed on this point, but our initial interpretation is that the cost, if it's related to 2019, would not be allowable since it is not incurred during the covered period. Again, the standard here is incurred and paid. So that leads me to what does incurred and paid really mean? So how are we interpreting incurred and paid for qualified expenses? Again, I feel like a broken record here, but we're awaiting guidance on incurred or paid. However, we do know, this is what we know, the PPP funds cover eight week period. So most likely you're gonna to need to prorate items such as interest, rent, and utilities. 
Obviously, there's a different amount, a number of days in March, April, and May, which all may include the covered period for you, a little bit different than the two months that we hear. So at this point, we're saying follow the service date for utilities and for rent and interest, make sure they represent an eight weeks of expense. This doesn't have to be a real formal exercise, but what you could do is do a simple proration of math, maybe write it on the bill, keep it in the file, and then we'll see. If, if more guidance comes out and they change it to a month to make it easy on us, um, at least then we know we can include those extra days. Um, if not, you have those, that eight week period proration. Again, hopefully your forgiveness does not um, rely, it's not a significant amount of your forgiveness, um, those extra, some, we have some clients looking at extra five days here when you're looking at April and May. Um, so hopefully that's not a breaker for you, but I just want you to be prepared, maybe do the proration, know what it means to you, and we'll bring you that guidance as it comes out. So of course those expenses would need to be supported by ne necessary documentation. You wanna have your loan and your rent agreements ready, and you wanna keep those utility bills. So this is a big question now. Everyone's wondering what type of documentation they are going to be expecting their lenders to request, especially since, as Ryan noted, there is this now provision that any loan over $2 million might be subject to an audit or whatever they're defining an audit as. So we wanted to bring you what we're seeing in the marketplace from the lenders. So we would expect the lenders are going to require at least the following. The borrower certification that's required under this section of the act noted there. Um, the, that basically will certify that you're spending the funds at, at appropriately under the Act. Also, your Payroll Protection Program, your PPP application form, the number's there, 2483, along with any su supporting documentation that you originally submitted with the application. So you want to keep that handy as well. Also, anyone that is self-employed and has a Schedule C, you're want, going to want to have your 2019 Schedule C available. And it's possible you would have submitted that already anyway with your application, but keep that handy. You will also need to have a schedule detailing how the proceeds were utilized. This can be a simple Excel spreadsheet, although we are seeing some really nice ones coming out from the lending institutions. So as we go through these weeks, please keep in contact either with your banker or watch their website. Um, if they have a template of a certain, it might be easier to use that and might help in their review and certainly will give you some insight on how they're viewing some of these items. Next, you would also need supporting documentation for gross payroll. I mentioned the Form 941, which is your quarterly federal, uh, a federal payroll form that's filed your state quarterly wage, unemployment, insurance, tax reporting forms, or equivalent payroll forms. From the Payroll Processing Service, we are seeing a lot of those come out. So as you watch your email from, if you use one of the larger services, um, just watch those and see what they have available as well. Lastly, evidence of rent, mortgage interest, and utilities. You, this could be bank statements, canceled checks, or statements from those service providers, and again, the copies of the leases and the mortgage statements may also be required. Make sure that they're signed, that they were in effect before February 15th, and that you have them available. Also a note that we've seen some lenders um, indicating they may request additional information at their discretion as they review the forgiveness applications. So that's all I have. Um, next, we're going to have a polling question. And, um, uh, just a reminder, with your polling question, let me go back, see if I have control. Okay, there it is. Um, you have to answer all three questions to get your credit. And the question here is, do you anticipate that your employees will be able and willing to return to work? Yes, I've been in contact with most of them. It's a mixed response. Some are willing, some are hesitant. Or lastly, I think I'm going to face a lot of obstacles recalling employees. So please take a minute, answer your polling question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie, who's going to talk about resuming operations. Thank you, Bethany. Okay, so let's talk a bit about preparing your business and your employees to resume post-quarantine operations. 
Governor Wolf announced critical protections for the workers needed to run and operate life-sustaining businesses. This order became effective on Sunday, April 19th at 8 p.m. Failure to comply with these requirements will result in enforcement actions that could include citations, fines, or license suspensions. As Ryan reviewed with you earlier, the Wolf Administration is partnering with the public health and economic experts to monitor the metrics used for safe reopening by taking a regional sector-based approach. We'll talk about how you can, can prepare now so when the data supports reopening in your region and sector, you'll be ready to get back to business. Let's first talk about preparing your business to reopen. You'll want to develop a business continuity strategy around implementing new safety guidelines. As you prepare to return to your new normal business operations, you'll want to think through what the worker safety order means to your business, employees, and patrons. Prepare yourself for multiple possible scenarios and develop a response plan for each. There are a lot of unknowns, and if we've learned anything over the past several weeks, we now know that businesses need to be agile enough to pivot very quickly. You will likely need to get creative in how you conduct your business. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this consideration. You are now required to make masks available for your employees and patrons. It's, a, it's recommended that you conduct business by appointment. And when that's not feasible, you should limit your building occupancy to less than 50% of the number stated on your certificate of occupancy. Are floor markers necessary to indicate where patrons should stand in order to maintain space distance? Plexiglass barriers at the reception desk and in locations where there's customer interaction and maybe perhaps installed between workspaces. Have you considered how you're going to procure and stock the necessary supplies that are hard to come by right now? These are all considerations that you need to evaluate. Let's talk about one of your most valuable assets, your workforce. It's critical to develop a well thought out communication plan for your workforce. You want to map out multiple scenarios that I mentioned that could impact them directly and have a communication plan for each. Upon pre preparing to return to the physical work location, determine how you're going to contact those employees who have been furloughed or laid off. What do you need to communicate to them? Communicate your worker safety order response plans with your employees and make sure to clearly outline expectations and protocols. Document and communicate your new safety measures and expectations around wearing masks, hand washing, meetings, breaks, and what to expect in common areas. Utilize telephone and video conferencing when possible for work-related meetings and gatherings. And when those are not an option, it's best to hold meetings in an open, well-ventilated spaces. We may even start seating, see meetings being conducted outside on nice days. What will their workspace look like? How will you create space between cubicles? How will you distance and provide barriers for workstations that have an open concept? How will you handle access into your building? Will you implement a single point of entry and assign staggered arrival times? How will you manage the stairwells and elevator usage? Will you allow your employees to return to the office after they leave to go grab lunch or run an errand? There's a lot of things here to consider, and if it's not enough on your plate, let's talk about policies and procedures. You'll want to make sure that you conduct a thorough review of your company policies and make any edits as necessary to ensure they are consistent with public health recommendations and existing state and federal laws. You will, will you need to institute a flexible work schedule and telecommuting policy to accommodate your employees' availability? Maintain flexible policies that permit employees to stay home to take care of children due to school and child care closures or to care for a sick family member. Review your leave policies and make sure they incorporate some of that flexibility. Of course, in true HR fashion, you'll need to make sure that your employees are aware of the updated policy and that they understand them. You might want to consider obtaining a signed acknowledgement form from each employee just to infirm that they've read them and they understand the revised policies and procedures. You'll also want to provide employee assistance program information and community resources to your employees as a way of providing support for the increased stress and pressure that your workforce is facing during this time. Some will be dealing with financial strains, social and emotional struggles for themselves or family members, and 
Some are homeschooling their children while balancing work responsibilities, and others are struggling to cope with the death of a loved one or friend. Talk to your employees. Be sure to really listen to them in order to understand their concerns and what's on their mind. Some employees may be at high risk or have a family member at high risk, and worry may weigh heavy on their minds. Provide resources to offer and offer grace as everyone adapts to what this means and the new normal that everyone is adjusting to. Knowing they are heard and supported will establish leadership and company loyalty. As I mentioned, the coronavirus outbreak has impacted the financial stability of many families. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to share some resources. As a result of the coronavirus outbreak, families who didn't previously struggle are now experiencing financial and food insecurity, some of which may be too embarrassed to speak up and ask for help and will struggle in silence. When you provide EAP information to your employees, I strongly encourage you to also include information on where they can find financial and food resources. In order to allow your employees to save face, I recommend that you don't ask them to come to you for that information, just provide it upfront to everybody across the board. Expect to have increase in absenteeism. Develop a plan in order to continue your essential business functions should you experience higher than usual absenteeism. How will you respond to absences related to illness or caring for family members that are sick? What about the employees who need to remain home because school and daycare and summer camp is closed? You'll want to prepare by cross-training employees to perform essential functions and maintain business continuity regardless of who is absent. Have multiple backups for those key positions. One can only hope that you won't have an exposure in your business. However, the reality you need to plan for it. In order to manage your exposure, routine cleaning and disinfecting all high-touch services and doorknobs, handrails, elevator buttons, workstations, keyboards, telephones, et cetera. Discourage sharing of tools and equipment when possible and ensure that you have a sufficient number of janitorial employees or cleaning service in place that can immediately and effectively respond should you experience a confirmed exposure. Provide tissues for coughing and sneezing and no touch waste receptacles. It's highly recommended that you stock disposable wipes throughout the building so that commonly used surfaces can be wiped down by employees before and after each use. Place hand sanitizers in multiple locations and post hand washing signs to encourage hand hygiene. Upon discovery of exposure, a person who is confirmed to have the coronavirus or is probable to have it based on displaying classic symptoms, the PA Department of Health has outlined appropriate protocols such as immediately close off ventilation and wait 24 hours before disinfecting, notify impacting, impacted employees while, maintain, while maintaining confidentiality of the infected person. We recommend that you designate a safety officer to ensure that employees are adhering to recommendations and proper PPP, PPE is stocked and readily available. The PA Department of Health recommends that employers, especially those in high numbers of confirmed case areas, conduct temperature checks as a matter of routine. But businesses that have a confirmed or probable exposure are required to implement temperature screenings before employees enter the business prior to the start of work for at least 14 days post the confirmed exposure. The CDC website provides a communication resource page, which offers a wide variety of free print and web materials. Um, this is a tremendous website. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. I highly encourage you to visit, download their materials, and post them um, what's appropriate to you. They do provide them in multiple languages. And like I said, you don't need to recreate the wheel. It's already there for you, um, visually easy to read and follow. Okay, so we're going to pause here for a moment and we'll do another polling question. Again, to be eligible for CPE, three polling questions must be answered. It should pop up here soon. Okay, are you prepared to supply the necessary personal protective equipment when you do reopen? Yes, we are fully stocked. 
no, but I think we are making progress, or no, I am struggling to find supplies. We'll leave that up for a moment, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to some of our FAQs that we have. First one, how do we manage our employees' expectations upon their return to work? This is a great question. We, we recommend that if it makes sense for your business to conduct a pre-return to work survey with your employees in order to glean insight into their comfort level around returning to work, along with an opportunity to inquire if given the option where they would prefer to work, continue telecommuting or return to the office or a combination of the two. When you begin communicating with your employees, do your best to provide enough detail in order to create a visual of what it's gonna look like to help your employees make that transition. You know, will they have scheduled arrival times? Do you have to have alternating shifts? Things along those lines. And, you know, be sure to indicate who they should contact if they have any questions about accessing the building. Are businesses required to supply or are businesses required to approve or supply a particular type of mask to their employees and customers? The short answer, no. Employers don't have to pro provide a particular brand or get their, get their supply from a particular vendor, but they do have to make masks available for all of their employees and any patrons that would come in. But as long as you're following the Department of Health guidelines, anything is sufficient, including those home, homemade masks or even bandanas or scarves um, is sufficient as well. I have an employee who has shared with HR that they have anxiety and covering their mouth and nose may lead to a panic attack and other serious mental conditions. So an employee is not required to wear a mask under certain circumstances, such as if they have a medical condition, if it impedes their vision, or if it would prevent them from operating equipment or executing a task safely. Are employees who work outdoors, such as landscapers or waste management, required to wear a mask? Yes, the only exception here would be, again, if it's unsafe to operate equipment or to execute a task or if it would impede their vision as well as having, if they have a medical condition. What should we do if a patron does not have a mask? Do we refuse entry to, into our building? So the Department of Health recommends that businesses provide masks for all customers who may not have one. Um, you can consider uh, distributing flyers, reminding customers of the Secretary of Health's order, along with some how-to instructions to make their own if necessary. Um, and uh, you'll want to avoid you know, confrontation when it comes to that. And so just consider your policy around, you know, how would you treat somebody if they came into your business without shoes or you know, a shirt? What if an employee refuses to wear a mask? So the Department of Health does not tell employers how to manage these situations. Um, however, it does dictate that all employees of life-sustaining businesses with the exclusion of those with a medical condition, and if a, fat, if a mask causes safety concerns, or while sequestered alone in a room or an unshared personal office, they must wear a mask in the workplace. And you'll wanna develop a PPE policy that outlines those expectations and how you will respond if there is failure to comply. So if we can maintain social distancing, are masks still mandatory? Yes, masks are still ma mandatory. Individuals that work or are in group settings are at risk and masks should be worn at all times. You're not required to wear a mask if you're driving alone in your car or with a family member from your same household, but outside of that, you are required to wear a mask. Last question here. Um, we are developing a plan for when we are able to reopen our business. Do you have recommendations on where we can find personal protective equipment and thermometers? So we recommend that you start first with your current office supply vendor to see what they have available for you. Many are offering cleaning supplies, hand sanitizers, plexiglass shields, and some are even offering thermometers. If you aren't successful with your current vendor, the state of Pennsylvania has created a company and product information directory that was established as a means of connecting Pennsylvania businesses and organizations that are seeking various PPD. And you can see it here, um, and the link uh, is, is there on the screen as well. So if you need to procure some, you can start there as well. 
So we're going to take a moment here and do our last polling question before Ryan closes out our webinar. Okay, we'll bring that polling question up in a moment. There it is. Um, this is our fourth and final polling question. This is more of a, an optional polling question. Certainly encourage you to answer it, but uh, this, is, this is the extra one that we've had the last few weeks. Uh, so this one is please indicate whether you would like RKL to follow up with you regarding any of these topics. I uh, check all that applies so you can check more than one topic below. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these, but just again, these are not necessarily thing suggestions for us to cover on a on a webinar. These are more for if you want us to follow up with you individually. Uh, feel free to check all that apply here. Uh, to close things out then for the day, I wanted to uh, just quickly touch on the Main Street Lending Program. Um, really, this is something that we've we've hit on briefly before. Uh, not going to go into this much at all, given the, the time, uh, but we have some information on this slide and a much more detailed blog that we released last night. Uh, the Main Street Lending Program uh, information was updated by the Federal Reserve yesterday morning. I would say that they frankly overhauled the program, uh, so anybody who was looking into that before, make sure you check out uh, all the new guidance that was, that was out there and certainly start with our blog. Uh, we think that we've done a great job in uh, taking roughly 30 pages of documentation and trying to make it really digestible. Uh, so our link is to that is on the lower right-hand corner of, of your screen then. And finally, before we close out, I did want to highlight uh, two more things. Uh, first off, um, Bethany let me know that she unfortunately skipped the slide on independent contractors. Um, just so you know, the answer to the independent contractor question is that independent contractors do not include, get included on uh, as payroll costs on the company that they do work for. Uh, they would file their own application uh, like a self-employed individual uh, and they would follow those those rules so if you have a, a company that has both employees and independent contractors your employees count as payroll costs your independent contractors do not count for yours they go they go and get their own own loan with their own rules uh, and then lastly just want to go over the polling results uh, that we have uh, poll one if your business is currently restricted from operating, do you plan to reopen as soon as permitted? We had 886 responses, 40% yes, 9% no, 51% operating at or near capacity. Uh, so based on a large part of our audience, 91% uh, are, are, are either back to work or, or ready to get back to work. Uh, poll two, do you anticipate that your employees will be able to, and willing to return to work? We had 671 responses there. Uh, the responses, yes, I've been in contact with most of them, 58%. Uh, it's a mixed response. Some are willing, some are hesitant, 37%. I think I'm going to face a lot of obstacles, recalling employees, 5%. Uh, so fortunately, we don't have uh, you know, lots of, of folks on the call that are expecting major difficulties on the, the rehiring. Uh, finally then, uh, our final question was, are you prepared to supply the necessary PPE equipment uh, when you do reopen? Uh, yes, we are fully stocked, 38%. No, but I think we are making progress, 49%. Uh, and finally, no, I am struggling to find supplies, 12%. Uh, so again, it seems like overly uh, either folks that are prepared or at least uh, um, uh, uh, folks that, that feel like they're going to be prepared, which is, which is great to hear. Uh, that wraps things up for the week. Um, feel free to visit our Coronavirus uh, Resource Center on our website. Like I said, check out the Main Street blog and, and many others. Uh, check out the recording to this when it's posted later today. I know, once again, we went over a ton of information. Tough to digest it all in, in this short period of time, but uh, the recording will be at your disposal later today. And, of course, we welcome you back next, next Friday at 11 o'clock. We'll see you then. Take care.